Go ahead and take a seat as you're doing so. Grab your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. We're going to start in verse 35. So Luke 18, verse 35. About two-thirds of the way in your Bible, you'll find the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, if you have a hard time finding it, don't be ashamed to go to the table of contents. That's what God gave it to us for. So uh, feel free to do that. If you don't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles under the chairs. Uh, grab one. If you don't have a Bible at home, take that Bible with you. That is our gift to us because we want every person to have a Bible in their home that they can read and they can study and they can go home after a sermon, uh, a message, and go and check up on us and make sure we're teaching God's Word here. So please feel free to take one of those Bibles home with you. So Luke 18, starting in verse 35. It was hot. And I mean, it was, it was one of those hot days that no one wanted to be outside in. It, it, it was blistering. The sun was just beating down that day. As he sat on the side of the road, the, the wind was whirling and swirling around him, and he could feel the dirt and dust beat against his face. To be honest, he didn't want to be outside that day. But that was his lot in life. You see, he was blind. And in his day and time, there was no option. It's not that he could work. Uh, in his day and time, the, the cultural norm was if you were blind or lame, you, you went and begged somewhere. And, and he had a place just outside of the city of Jericho, a, a place where travelers passed by constantly on their way to and from Jerusalem. And he would sit by the side of the road and beg for money so that he could live, so that he could put food on his table. And today was like any other day, except today was a little different because today he knew that there would be more travelers than normal because in Jerusalem was about to start a great religious holiday. And so pilgrims were coming from all over the world, from northern Israel and other countries, to come to Jerusalem and celebrate this religious holiday. So there were more travelers than normal, and because of the nature of what they were traveling to, these travelers were just a little more generous than most. And so he sat in the heat as that sun just beat down on him, waiting for someone to pass by. And so he picks up a rock and begins to just feel it, understand its contours and edges. And as he's just playing with the rock, he hears something. Not a lone traveler, not even a small group of travelers, but he hears a crowd, which is very unusual. He, he, he hears a crowd coming, and, and as the crowd passes by, he, he looks up and, and says, what's going on? And somebody looked down, and said, Jesus is coming by. Jesus. I've heard that name. I know that name somewhere. Oh, the travelers that pass by me have been talking about this Jesus. Some of them think that he's the coming Messiah that we've been waiting for. But all of them tell me and mention that Jesus is a healer. Jesus heals the sick, that he, he, uh, he touches the, the, the lame and they walk in. He touches the blind and they see. So he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he hears from the crowd, shh, keep quiet. Don't you know who he is? Be quiet. No, I won't. He thinks to himself, I'm going to be as loud as I can. I want Jesus to hear me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And just then, somebody grabs his hand and picks him up. And he says, what's going on? And the person who's touched him says, Jesus wants to see you. So they lead him to Jesus, and, and he, he's standing there, and suddenly hears a voice say, what do you want me to do for you? And he turns and says, Please, I want to receive my sight. And the voice says back, 
Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And that son that all he's ever known to be punishing and hot and miserable, he looks up and it's beautiful and it's glorious and it's amazing. He can see, he looks around, he sees the crowd that has surrounded Jesus and he looks in front of him and there's the Son of God standing right in front of him. And he says, thank you. And he he starts exclaiming, proclaiming, telling the crowd, I can see. And he starts celebrating the fact that a lifelong blindness is gone. And he starts glorifying God and praising him for the healing that he's just received. And then he turns and he looks at Jesus. And Jesus just smiles at him. Kind of nods. Kind of in celebration, almost receiving the praise. And he just gives kind of a a head nod, almost to say, come, follow me. And so the man does, praising God the entire way. Pretty amazing story. An account in the life of Jesus of a man who was born blind, encountered Jesus, and was healed of his blindness. Now, what I've just done here is not word for word out of the Bible. Uh, This is my interpretation of what I think it might have been like for this blind man to have had this encounter with Jesus Christ. But let's not dismiss the Bible. Let's read what it says, God's Word says about this. So look at Luke 18. We're going to start in verse 35. Luke 18 Starting in verse 35, let's hear what Luke says about this account. It says, As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd go by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately... He recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Amazing. What a great account in the life of Jesus of a healing of a blind man. Now, this encounter uh, has a lesson for us. And so let me kind of open with this. I'm a pastor, but even I as a pastor have had times in my life where I've felt farther from God than I wanted to feel. I've had times where I haven't felt as close to God as I thought I should be. And in many of those times, I've had moments where I've thought the span, the distance between me and Jesus, it's too great. It's too, he's too far away. And there's been moments in my spiritual walk, in my relationship with Jesus that I felt divided from him. And I don't want you to raise your hand, but have you ever felt like that? Have you ever had that moment where you go, I just don't feel close to him, and I feel like it's not possible to bridge the gap between myself and my Savior? If you're a follower of Christ, you've gone through this. Every follower of Christ goes through this at some time, if not multiple times in their lives. Uh, Because sin is always pulling us away from God, right? Uh, There's always that thing. So luckily for us, uh, this story, this account in Jesus' life of the blind man being healed um, gives us some indications of how to bridge the gap between us and Christ. And so before we dive into those, we have to first recognize the problem. And the problem is simply this. Something is always trying to keep you away from Jesus. Something is always trying to keep you away from Jesus. 
Now, in the story, the account of the blind man sitting by the road, it was the crowd. Because when the blind man cries out to Jesus, what's the response of the crowd? Be quiet. Shh, stop. Don't, don't talk. It's about us. Stop talking. We don't want to mess with your inconvenience right now. And so the crowd tried to keep the blind man from Jesus. But in our own lives, there are many things that can keep us or try to keep us from Jesus. I've already alluded to one. One of them is temptation and sin. Let's face it, every single person in this room, including myself, are sinners. We are all sinners, and we all fall short of the glory of God. Go read the book of Romans. We all fall short. We all have temptations. We all have those things that are constantly tempting us and pulling us away and keeping us and pushing us away from our relationship with Christ. It's always happening. It's always there. And so we put Jesus right here, and we say, we like you right here. We put you in the box, and then we make a sin choice, and we do this. And then many times we decide to live in that sin choice for a time, and we begin doing this, and we get further and further away from our Savior. And so sin does that. It actually creates a barrier between us and our Savior. It prevents us from having a super healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we have to recognize that that's the fact. That's what we live in day in and day out. And every one of your struggles are different from the person sitting next to you. Your struggle with sin and temptation is unique. And so is your neighbor's. And so we have to recognize that. Now, sin is just one of the things that can keep us away from God or can push us away from Him. Another thing is simply people. I, I would guess that most of us in this room have someone or a group of people in our lives that are not exactly fans of our faith in Jesus Christ. And they're not exactly encouraging us to pursue our relationship with Him. And the fact is, is, if you work, if you have family, if you live, you've got people like that in your life because they're all around us. The hard part is this. How many of us in this room are making choices, are saying things, are doing things that are keeping someone else from Christ? Because that's the last thing that we want to do is to keep someone from a life-changing relationship for, with Christ. And so we have to examine the people around us and we have to examine ourselves to make sure that we're not the ones pushing people or keeping people away from Jesus. And then we've got to figure out how to handle the people who are in our own life who are pushing or keeping us away from Jesus. Uh, the next thing that keeps us away is simply the culture. Guys, if you turn on the TV, everything on the television pushes us away from Christ. It encourages things that aren't exactly what Christ would stand behind and say, yes, this is me. We don't live in a pro-Christian culture anymore, people. We, we live in a culture that is pushing Christ further and further away, and so culture is trying to push us further and further away. And so we have to learn how to struggle and fight against that so that we can have a healthy relationship with our Savior Jesus. So there's always something trying to keep us away, whether it's sin or people or culture or what else or a combination of all of them, there's always something pushing us away. And so now that we've recognized the problem, let's look at this story, this account of Jesus's life and figure out what we can do to keep that, to maintain that healthy relationship. The first thing that we need to do is when you feel far from Jesus, call to him. When you, as a person, feel far from Jesus, call to him. Now, I recognize that many of you in this room right now are struggling. Whether you're struggling physically with a sickness or an ailment or a problem with your body, whether you're struggling mentally and emotionally with something that's going on, whether you're struggling financially uh, with bills or a, a difficult financial situation that you've gotten caught up in, or whether you're struggling spiritually, uh, you're struggling in your relationship with God. Every single one of us struggles. Whether you're a follower of Christ or not, we struggle. That's a fact of life. So when you're struggling, and if you're struggling now, are you calling out to Jesus? 
Because the blind man, in his struggle, what did he do? He called out. And I want you to notice a couple of things about what he does in this calling out. The first thing that I want you to notice is this. When he calls out to Jesus, he recognizes who Jesus is and the power that Jesus has in his life. And it's all in that one sentence. The blind man looks up and what does he say? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Right? Now, when he says Jesus, son of David, he is recognizing that Jesus is the son of God, the Messiah, the Christ that has, they've been waiting for. Because the phrase son of David was not something that people just threw around. That was a phrase, that was a title of great honor in that day and time. It's a reference to King David from First and Second Samuel. And the idea here is that when you called out to someone and gave them the title, called out to them with the title, Son of David, you were recognizing that they were someone of high standing and had great authority in your life. Now, let's just look at the black and white of this. Why would this man recognize Jesus as a high authority in his life? Because he recognized that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. That's the only reason why this man would call Jesus by this title. And so he first recognizes, you, Jesus, are God. And then he says, have mercy on me. Now, if I go to the hospital and visit somebody in the hospital who's struggling with a physical ailment, how many do you think say, oh, see, have mercy on me? None of them. Because I don't have the power to heal anybody except through the power of the Holy Spirit. I do not have the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual ability to put my hands and in my name heal somebody. I can pray for somebody in the name of Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit, maybe they'll get healed. But I don't have that power. So why would this man, the blind man, look at Jesus and say, have mercy on me? Because he recognizes that Jesus Christ alone has the power to heal him. So what did I say? The first thing that we want to notice about this account is that the blind man recognized who Jesus was and the power he had in his life. And the statement he makes makes that very clear. The second thing that I want you to notice is that he was very persistent, wasn't he? When he calls out the first time, what happens? Everybody tells him to shut up, right? What does he do? The Bible, the book of Luke right here, actually says all the more. In other words, he didn't just continue a little bit. He got louder, and he continued. In other words, this blind man was not going to allow Jesus to pass by and pass him without having heard him. He was not going to allow Jesus to not encounter him unless Jesus chose to not encounter him. He was going to make it very clear that he needed help and that he was turning to Jesus for that help. And there was no way that he was going to let Jesus get by without hearing that. So he continued. He was persistent. And what did that persistence do? It got Jesus' attention. And Jesus reached out, called him to him, And that's when he heals him. The man was persistent. So here's a question for you sitting here today. How many of you, when things get hard, stop your persistence? I think we all do at some point. Don't raise your hand. How many of us in this room are like me, and you have started a Bible reading plan in January, and before you hit February 1st, you fizzled out? We've all done it in this room. Every single one of us have done this. We're not persistent enough. We're not pursuing Christ enough. This man was not going to give up. So why do we all too many times when things get hard or they just become inconvenient, we stop? And we all go through those slumps and it's just because we either get lazy or things get tough or something distracts us or something happens. When in reality... We need to be like the blind man here, and we need to be persistent. We need to continually not give up on seeking a life-changing relationship with Christ. So, when you feel far away, call out to Jesus. And when you call out, Jesus pulls you in. Hear me on this. When you call out, Jesus pulls you in. 
when I was a kid, uh, my parents bought and installed an above-ground swimming pool. Now, I'm from the Texas panhandle. I mean, redneck as it gets. Um, and so above ground, we were living the high life. I mean, that was like caviar and pearls, buddy. So we had this above ground pool, and I distinctly remember the summer after the pool was installed was one of the best summers of my entire life because we spent every day for hours in that pool with my siblings and my cousins and friends would come over, and we loved that pool. And one of our favorite games to play was Marco Polo. You know what Marco Polo is, right? Someone's it, they close their eyes, they yell Marco, everybody else yells Polo, and they try to seek them out based off of what they're hearing. And so they're, they yell Marco, Polo, and so they start pursuing based off of the Polos that they're hearing in the pool. Now I mentioned that many of you in this room are struggling right now, so let me give you a word of encouragement here. When you call out to Jesus, when you yell Unlike Marco Polo, when you yell out to Jesus, he doesn't turn and walk away like they do in Marco Polo. The fact is, is when we place Jesus right here and we create that big gap, when we call out, Jesus, I need you, have mercy on me, he does this and spans the gap to embrace us. As a matter of fact, when you call out to him and he begins to turn and come to you, he comes to you calling your name. He doesn't yell polo. He yells your name as he embraces you and lifts you up and encourages and guides. He's calling your name. He cares for you. He is waiting for you to call out for him to bridge, to span that gap. Look at what James, the first half of James 4, 8 says. It says, as you draw near to God, he draws near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The idea being, uh, I heard a preacher many, many years ago say this, when we create that huge gap between us and Jesus and we call out his name, it's us taking one tiny little step forward and Jesus making a God-sized step forward to bridge the rest of the gap between us. You see, the moment we call out to him, he is by our side. Look at the, pro the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, Google it. Uh, look that up. That is a great example of what God, what Jesus is doing uh, when we walk away from him, when we step away from that relationship. He's sitting on the porch of his house watching for us. And the moment he sees that we're coming back, he comes running to us. The fact is, is that he pursues us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And let's be honest, when there's a gap between us and Jesus, did Jesus create the gap? Never. Jesus never creates a gap between us and him. We are always the ones who create the gap. There's always a sin uh, or a rebellion or something creating that gap, pulling us away, creating that gap between us and Christ. But when we call out to him, he comes running to us calling our name. He pulls us in when we call out. So when you call out and he pulls you in, what should your response be? Well, we see in this, the, the account of the blind man, the blind man calls out and Jesus pulls him in, correct? And then what's the response of the blind man? He gets healed and he begins to follow Christ. So our response is follow in faith. It's simply that. When we have that life-changing encounter and Jesus pulls us in, we are called to then follow him in faith. And guys, I'm not naive on this. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I know that this is a huge step for all of us. To follow Christ in faith is not as easy as it sounds. I'm not standing up here going, all right, guys, follow Jesus in faith. Thanks for coming. See you later. I know that's not as easy as it is. I know that it takes much more than that. But the fact is, is that's our response. So let me go back to the example here. We put Jesus here. We create the gap. Jesus comes running, pulls us back in. And then two days later, we're doing this again. And we play this game of, oh, I'm going to do some tango shimming with you, Jesus. And I'm going to come close. And then I'm going to step far away again. And I'm going to come close again. When in reality, when we come into Christ, when he pulls us back in, 
he leans into us and he says, I'm glad you're back, now go and sin no more. In other words, when we go through those struggles and we call out to him and he pulls us back into that relationship, he wants us to grow through that. He wants us to grow in him as we do that back and forth. If I'm, take my wife, Jana and I have a great relationship, but if I do something really stupid, which I do on a regular basis, and I damage my relationship with my wife, and then I get my head straight and I do something to try and begin to make that up and build my relationship back with her, if I go and do the exact same stupid thing two days later and I do this to my relationship with her, am I being a good, healthy husband? Not at all. As a follower of Christ, when we build that gap, when we separate ourselves from Christ, and then he pulls us back into him, he wants us to learn. He wants us to grow in him. Learn something from your mistakes. Learn something from the sins and the temptations that you fell into so that you don't go back into them again. It's something we constantly have to do. Now, when he does pull you in, It's life-changing. And I realize that some of you in this room do not have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And maybe what you've heard today and maybe what you've seen from friends who uh, are Christians, maybe you're curious about this. Maybe you're wondering what's going on. And let me just say, we are all sinners. I mentioned that earlier. We are lawless. We have broken God's law. And as criminals, lawbreakers, we deserve punishment. And so what Jesus did is Jesus was God's son, came to this earth, lived a sinless life, and at the end of his life, he died on a cross. And what that death did was cover up, was make us, it makes us innocent of those crimes. And rather than receiving the punishment that we deserve, we get forgiveness and mercy instead. And so the fact is, is that if you've never stepped into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, he's pulling you toward one. He wants you to come in to that relationship with him. But you have to be willing to say, okay, I'll I'll do this. I I, want to step into this relationship, and in doing so, I want to live my life for you, God. And if you've got questions about that, if... I'm not asking you to make a commitment right now, but if you've got questions or you're curious, we're going to have our prayer team up here at the front after the service. Come talk to them about it. Or we'll have uh, pastors and leaders in both of these connection centers, right outside these doors and right outside this door right here. Come talk to us. We would love to talk to you and answer questions. We're not going to pull you up on stage and make you do something that's super embarrassing. We just want to begin a conversation about what a life-changing relationship with Jesus looks like. And so come talk to us if if you're there. Now, if you are a follower of Christ and you do have a life-changing relationship with him and you call out to him and he pulls you in, he may be calling you to take action. Remember, he, he pulls you in and what does he do? He goes, I'm so glad you're back. Now go and sin no more. And so what are you doing to keep yourself from sinning more? If there's a temptation that you know you're just particularly susceptible to, if you just kind of keep falling into the same thing over and over again, what are you doing to prevent yourself from having access to that sin in the future so that you can honor Christ by going and sinning no more? What are you doing? What are the action steps? Well, if you want to grow in your relationship closer to Christ, We'll have small groups, our, what we call life groups here at Calvary. Our life group signups are going to start here in a few weeks. And if you want to increase your relationship, if you want your relationship with Christ to be stronger, go sign up for a small group, for a life group. That's what they're there for. That's an action step that you can take right now here in a few weeks to improve your relationship with Christ. Now let me get a little more specific. Maybe you're struggling financially. And maybe you're not honoring God with the way you manage your money. And if you're in that place where you're living paycheck to paycheck and you've got all these bills and you don't know how to get out of all this, we've got a class coming up called Financial Peace University. Signups are going on. The information is in your bulletin. If you're in that place, 
contact the people running that class and get some information on it because that is an action step that you can take right now to begin the process of getting out of the sin or the mistakes you've made and honoring Christ and getting out of the mess that you're in financially. So go check out Financial Peace University. Now, when he pulls us in and we take action, the next response, the last response is to praise him. Because what did the blind man do? Jesus calls him, he pulls him in, he heals the blind man, the blind man praises God, he celebrates, and then what did everybody else do? They followed along praising God after seeing what had happened. Your response, my response, when God pulls us in and starts changing our life is to praise him for what he's done and what he's doing. And so every one of us is going to struggle. When you do, will you call out to Jesus and will you recognize the power and authority he has in your life and in this world. And when you do that, when he pulls you in, will you follow him in faith? Join me in prayer.